mode. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on sonographic evaluation of the posterior thigh, presented by Dr. Madeira Call. The AIUM is pleased to present this event in collaboration with the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. At the conclusion of this activity, participants should be able to perform a comprehensive screening exam for hamstring injury in the athlete and understand the relationships of the proximal hamstring tendon complex, as well as list anatomic landmarks and understand the variants of commonly seen posterior thigh muscle tendon injuries. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Hall and Kathy Minton have no disclosures. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be able to access the CME test and evaluation located on the AIUM website. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. During tonight's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now, we're pleased to present Dr. Madeira Call. Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, I'm very excited about this collaborative webinar series uh, between AIUM and AMS with them. And I'd really like to thank Kathy and AIUM for hosting tonight and everybody for joining us um, right during your dinner or your time to you put your kids to bed or whatever everybody's doing after a long day of work. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, my name is Madeira Paul. I'm a sports medicine physician you know, here at the University of Iowa. My primary training is in physical medicine rehabilitation, uh, where I did my residency at the Mayo Clinic, and then I did a sports medicine fellowship there as well, uh, where I retrieved training in uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound. I'm currently the director of sports and musculoskeletal ultrasound here at the University of Iowa uh, Sports Medicine. I'm a team physician for the Hawkeyes as well as the USC team, and I'm the vice chair of the AMS Listen Sports Ultrasound Committee. Uh, as mentioned, tonight we're going to cover the posterior thigh with our focus being predominantly on the hamstring. And I know this can sometimes be a very intimidating or challenging area to scan. And I'm hoping to take everybody through a nice scanning protocol uh, that allows you to evaluate these injuries uh, quickly and also <clears throat> convey the information um, you know, either to yourselves or to your, your team physician or referring provider um, that they're really going to want to know that helps them in making some uh, prognosticating um, measures for the athletes and um, helping get people back uh, on the field to play. So as mentioned, I have no relevant disclosures related to this presentation. I do have a few other uh, disclosures which are mentioned here. And we went through our main learning objectives already. So we'll hop right in uh, to the general scanning technique. So the first thing you want to do, as with any um, you know, ultrasound evaluation, is to take your transducers. And, and this should come with pretty careful consideration in the posterior thigh, because you're going to be evaluating patients of different body habits, and particularly those who are looking at athletes. You know, if I'm looking at a, um, you know, at a distance runner or a football linebacker, I'm likely going to need to use a little bit different uh, equipment, different transducers or distance settings for that. 
And even in the same athlete, I may have to go back and forth between transducers depending on which region I'm looking at and exactly what type of detail I'm trying to uh, to achieve. And so I usually try to image as most as I can with a high-frequency linear transducer, but I will have a lower-frequency curvilinear transducer always available and ready for either the larger patients or when I need to get a, a little bigger field of view or I'm trying to... Um, you know, see a little bit deeper structures. And so you may need to go back and forth between those two. Uh, and then especially on the larger athlete, doing your initial survey with the curvilinear transducer and then fine-tuning that with the linear can be a helpful, um, helpful technique. <clears throat> uh, as I just mentioned, doing the survey in the transverse or axial plane uh, is always what you want to do. Some people refer to this as an elevator technique uh, where you're kind of going up and down. And, and we'll walk you through this, but I like to do this for each individual muscle. And so we'll, we'll start up approximately at the tendon, and then I like to take each muscle from the tendon all the way down, approximately to distally, and just do a careful evaluation just to make sure I'm not overlooking any subtle pathology. Uh, particularly when you're evaluating athletes, sometimes subtle pathology can still be very symptomatic, uh, and it's important to recognize that and be able to characterize it. So landmarks for orientation are exceedingly important to the, in the thigh. And I think that's why this often is an intimidating area. Is It can be difficult to know where you're at whenever you're in the middle of a thigh and you're looking at something that looks abnormal and you're trying to describe it. And so the, the good thing is is back in the posterior thigh, there are several um, readily identifiable landmarks that will help you quickly orient to where you are uh, so you don't have to spend all day tracing things back and forth trying to figure out where you're at. So, so we'll go through those, and those are probably really the key take-home points, particularly for those of you who aren't, aren't already comfortable scanning this area, is really know your landmarks so that you can quickly orient to where you're at. That'll be the biggest, you know, again, the biggest take-home point from this talk. And then the other thing not to forget is the history and physical here are going to be really helpful um, for recognizing pathology, particularly if it's early or subtle. And I'm sure there's a mix of folks on the call tonight, um, some of which are probably, you know, team physicians, um, you know, who, who are, of course, are going to be looking at this history and physical, but others might just be, um, you know, people who are just doing imaging uh, alone. And so it still is going to be helpful to be able to get a little bit of that key history for these folks, um, and, and that's going to really be able to, to hone in your examination and provide some of those key details that you need, particularly uh, when the injury occurred. Because we'll go through this again, but if, if you're standing too soon after the injury um, or if you're standing, you know, more of a chronic injury, those things will be important in how you're going to convey your information and read your scan. And so, so you really need to have some of those key components. So the first thing we'll start at is going to be our home base for the posterior thigh. And this is going to be what's referred to as the hyperechoic triangle or the triangle of Cohen. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so what this uh, hyperechoic triangle is, is going to be right below the gluteal fold. And so this is going to be an easy spot um, to find really on any patient. You can put your transducer in the, a transverse imaging plane right below the gluteal fold, and you should see three hyperechoic structures. So you should see the conjoint tendon closer to the, to the surface here, so more superficial. On the lateral aspect will be the sciatic nerve. And on the medial aspect will be the semimembranosus tendon. The semimembranosus tendon is this characteristic tadpole appearance uh, with the tendon lying uh, here more lateral on this membrane moving medially. Uh, and then the sciatic nerve will have its usual particular appearance lying laterally. So this should be our home base um, uh, landmark that we start at every, every posterior thigh exam. And again, it's just below the gluteal fold. We'll then want to translate proximally from this location up to the ischial tuberosity or the origin of the hamstring tendons. And what we're going to look for is the semimembranosus to move underneath the conjoint tendon to take its position deep and lateral at the ischial tuberosity. So we'll let this thing loop run uh, a few times over so everyone can get their eye on it. So here's that semimembranosus. It's going to move laterally and deep, or you know, deep on the screen here, or anterior to sit on the ischial tuberosity at this position. The conjoint tendon is going to form here. This is our semi-tendinosis muscle uh, that's blending in, and that conjoint tendon is going to take this position here, a bit more medial and a bit more superficial or posterior on the ischial tuberosity. 
So that's the short axis view of the hamstring tendons from the, the hyperbolic triangle. We'll then want to orient the transducer into the long axis view as well. And for me, the, the long axis view really almost throughout the entire posterior thigh evaluation is more of a confirmatory view. So it's very important, but I always start in the short axis, and I think that gives you uh, the majority of your information, and the long axis is more of a confirmatory view. Here we can see again the hyperbolic line of the ischial tuberosity. Here's the hamstring tendon in long axis with the side of the screen being distal. And then here's our gluteus maximus overlying the tendon. The hypoechoic structure you see here is going to be muscle of the semitendinosus. And there will often even be some, some direct muscular attachments onto the ischial tuberosity. And that's really going to be the only muscle that you're going to see at this level. The other thing I think that's very important to remember here is that this is all gluteus maximus. And you can see how far down the gluteus maximus is coming. It's still it's coming off of the screen here. And here's our hamstring tendon. So the hamstring tendon lies deep to the, to the gluteus maximus. So you're really, I mean, in, in on the butt right here. You're not down below the gluteal fold where, where I commonly see people think the hamstring tendon originates. That's really the area where we were just at, at the hyperopoic triangle. So the actual origin of the hamstrings, the proximal hamstring tendons, are a bit higher than a lot of people actually realize. And I think this you know, image here showing um, how much the gluteus maximus continues to move distal uh, helps illustrate that. And so if we go back here again to this, uh, to this image of the proximal hamstring tendons, we can see now fairly well the conjoint tendon component here, the semimembranosus component here, uh, a bit deeper and, and um, more medial. And then here, or more lateral, sorry. And then here is the sciatic nerve again. And then here is all gluteus maximus. And this is a corresponding uh, cadaveric cross section. And we're going to just go through um, the, the hamstrings with, with correlative um, cadaveric cross sections and ultrasound images as we kind of work our way down from this. And this, again, is going to be our transducer position. So we can see uh, we're moving up proximally above the gluteal fold. So now we're going to see in the opposite direction. And again, we're going to watch these tendons build off of that issue of tuberosity. Here we're going to see the conjoined tendon building off. Here we're going to see the semimembranosus. And so again, watch the sinew loop come through. We'll see that membranosus blend off this way and move medial. Here's conjoined tendon. Semitendinosus muscle will be the first muscle we see here. And then we'll begin to see biceps femoris muscle forming on the opposite or lateral side of the conjoined tendon here. So this dynamic scan moving from the tuberosity to the hyperechoic triangle, from the triangle back to the tuberosity, is going to be very important. And the dynamic uh, nature of that is going to allow you to distinguish the different components of the proximal hamstring tendon. And this will be helpful when you're trying to determine uh, you know, is there a complete tear here? Is there a partial tear? Is it tendinosis? What's it involving? Uh, it's really being able to, to make this distinction in the different tendons. And you can see these quite well um, if you take your time and, and particularly using this dynamic um, scanning. The other thing I want to mention proximally here at the, at the hamstring tendon origin is going to be kind of what I call the forgotten hamstring. And that's the ischiochondular portion of the adductor magnus. So remember, the adductor magnus has two portions, and the ischiochondrular portion functions as a hamstring. And it actually has a large tendinous origin off of the ischial tuberosity. Uh, here we can see, and this can sometimes be a little confusing, and I'll try to, to make this clear for everybody. But here, if we look at the, the origin of the tendons on the ischial tuberosity, we'll see here's the semimembranosus, and it's going to be lying further anterior, which will look deep on our screen when we're imaging the patient in the probe position. And then the conjoint tendon is going to sit a bit further medial and a bit more posterior or superficial. And then if we continue to move medial and inferior, we're going to come to the origin of the adductor magnus. And you can see this is a pretty big origin. Um, you know, it's, it's comparable in size almost without a conjoint tendon. And, and from this drawing, you can see it's a pretty stout uh, tendon. So, so why is this important? Uh, I, I, this has become an interest of mine over the last year or so because I've actually begun to see a lot of patients complaining of pain uh, with correlative um, phonographic abnormalities at this location. So I think it's a, it's a site of actual pathology that's separate from that of the hamstring tendon proper. 
It also can be a pitfall in diagnosing proximal hamstring tendon avulsion. So if you're not aware that there's a relatively large um, tendon structure coming off the ischial tuberosity that's not the hamstring tendon, and you see this um, in the setting of a complete hamstring um, origin rupture, you're going to be apt to call that a partial tear, and then indeed it may not be a partial tear. And so I think it's very important um, to recognize uh, where this tendon uh, lives and the scanning technique to get there reliably so that if you're looking at an area that's not imaging optimally, uh, either because of a lot of pathology and, and swelling and tissue disruption with a patient's uh, body habitus, you'll be able to quickly identify this and not get confused. So what we want to do to identify the, the adductor magnus portion is we want to start at the hypercoat triangle again. Then we're going to move medial from that. So in the semi loop here, I'll pause it. Here's our semimembranosus. So the hypercoat triangle is going to lie over here in this area. So we no longer see the, the sciatic nerve. We don't really see the conjoined tendon. We see the semitendinosus muscle here. We've moved medial. And this is all adductor magnus muscle. So the adductor magnus is the big, huge muscle that we see on the bottom of the screen all while we're looking at the hamstrings that you know previously I would always just ignore. Uh, and hopefully you guys don't continue to ignore it. So as we move medially from the semitendinosus, we're going to begin to see another, uh, another hyperopoic structure and it's going to look similar to the semimembranosus. And so we follow that proximally, we'll follow it up to the issue of tuberosity, and that's the origin of the adductor magnus. So one more time, here is the second hyperopoic structure medial to the membranosus, and it moves up proximally and sits on the issue of tuberosity in the short axis origin. One more time, we'll follow this up, and it sits right there. So again, move medial from that hyperopoic triangle, find your second hyperopoic um, tendinous structure, follow approximately to the issue of tuberosity. Here are a few uh, cadaveric dissections that hopefully will make this a little bit more clear. Uh, we can see, again, this large tendon, uh, tendinous origin of the adductor magnus, and we can see it sitting medial and inferior to, on the issue of tuberosity, to the conjoined tendon, which, foot, which foot, um, footprint is right here. And so here's that conjoined tendon. We can see just medial and inferior, here's the adductor magnus, and then our semimembranosus is sitting farther anterior, so it's underlying the structure right through here. And if it's reflected back, then we can see it deep there. So a close-up view of the actual bony footprint, uh, again, will show the uh, footprint of the adductor magnus, medial and inferior, and then the conjoint tendon a bit superior and lateral. And if we put our transducer um, in this oblique imaging plane, um, then we'll be able to basically see on ultrasound exactly what we're seeing in this cadaveric study here. And so here is the adductor magnus origin, and then here's our conjoined tendon. And this is a little bit confusing, I think, whenever you first try to do this. But if you just remember the orientation and you follow these tendons up, it begins to make, uh, make quite a bit of sense. All right, so those are the, the tendinous origins. And so that's the, the hamstring proper, uh, as well as the adductor magnus issue condylar portion. The other thing proximally that we'll mention, and we're going to spend most of our time on the hamstrings, but I do want to mention the sciatic nerve because, um, because it does live here, and it often can be involved in hamstring pathology. So we already mentioned the sciatic nerve as part of the hypercoat triangle, uh, which we can see here again. If you're having difficulty distinguishing the sciatic nerve at this level, um, probably the easiest location to find the sciatic nerve will be in the issue of femoral space. And so if you move proximally, you'll be able to see the sciatic nerve overlying the quadratus femoris. So here's our ischial tuberosity. Here's our hamstring tendons that we already saw, gluteus maximus over the top. This is the quadratus femoris, which is um, a kind of a nice quadrangular hypoechoic muscular structure and the sciatic nerve is going to live right on top of there. And that's going to be a nice, easy place to identify the sciatic nerve, and then you can trace it distally uh, from that location. Uh, there are a few things that you may uh, consider looking for. There are some fascial bands which have been described along this location um, near the proximal hamstring tendon origin that could potentially cause some constriction or adhesion or compression in the sciatic nerve uh, at this level. I can't say that I've um, I've actually seen pathology from this at this location, although you can see in this uh, asymptomatic uh, subject here, uh, you know, you can see this fascial band quite nicely uh, attaching off the bottom of the G-max here over to the uh, hamstring origin. Um, but you can 
uh, not infrequently see problems with the sciatic nerve at this location associated with um, varying degrees of tendon pathology. And so it's not uncommon for folks to have what I call pseudo-sciatic symptoms where they'll have some radiating pain down their leg associated with their hamstring. And that's because the nerve lies effectively right on the hamstring tendon here. And so if you have anything that's causing um, swelling in the tendon um, or if you get scarring from an old tear, uh, that certainly can involve the sciatic nerve and you may be able to identify that. The other nerve back here to mention uh, is the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. Uh, <clears throat> which has also been implicated in some uh, pain syndromes of the posterior side. This nerve is a little bit challenging uh, to identify, particularly proximally, uh, but it's, it's fairly well identified in the popliteal fossa. And we can see in, in this uh, image here from the literature, um, these folks actually did a study where they injected uh, latex dye along the course of the nerve to prove that indeed they were able to try going to sit adjacent to the biceps femoris, uh, on the medial side of the biceps femoris in the popliteal fossa in the um, <clears throat> superficial aspect. And so um, like many of these superficial nerves, similar to the, the lateral femoral cutaneous uh, and saphenous and other that you may look at, um, these nerves kind of live in this little fascial plane um, surrounded by some fatty tissue, and, and that's often where they're going to be easiest to identify. And so if you find the nerve at this location, then you can then trace it proximally where it's going to move medial to lateral and then superficial over the biceps uh, to then move uh, along the course of the sciatic nerve more proximally. And so here's just an example. In the semi loop, I think it's easier to see. Uh, here's the biceps, and here's that posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. And <clears throat> right wherever it moves um, through the fascia, you'll often see this little area of fatty tissue right there that makes the nerve pretty uh, pretty easy to pick out. As you move proximally, we'll be able to identify the nerve here now. It's moving from proximal to distal. Here's the sciatic nerve, and here is the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, which is moving superficial or on top of the biceps. And so this is the, conju or the, uh, the conjoint tendon again here. This is biceps femoris muscle here, and then we'll see the move the nerve moving on top or superficial to that biceps femoris. So here's the fascicles we can see. They're now coming up over top of the biceps femoris, and this is conjoint tendons. So I'll let that run one more time so you can appreciate. There's the big sciatic nerve. Here are the fascicles um, coming out of that location on top of the biceps that then move superficial, and then we'll move down coursing along the biceps femoris, so close to your femoral cutaneous. Okay, so. Now we're going to move into the hamstring muscles and, and kind of march down uh, the thigh, looking at each of the muscles and some of the characteristics uh, of those muscles. I thought I'd, sh I'd shoot a quick selfie this morning uh, when I was working out, and, and then I put this in here for all you guys to see, uh, which is actually a lie because I was cleaning up after my four-year-old son this morning. So that's if I sound a little hoarse, that's probably why. Um, so. We'll start with the myotendinous junctions here. As I mentioned, the semi-tendinosis is going to be the first muscle you're going to see. And you often may see that even all the way up at the ischial tuberosity with some direct muscular attachments there. Um, so as we move off the tuberosity, the first muscle that we'll see is going to be semi-tendinosis. It's going to blend off right here, and it's going to become the largest muscle uh, quickly as it moves distal. Uh, then we're going to start to see the biceps femoris form. And so it's going to form on the lateral side of the conjoint tendon. So as we're moving down, here's conjoint tendon. We have semi-tendinosis, which is already uh, formed in a relatively large muscle at this point. We see the semi-membranosis uh, tendon and membrane here. All this is adductor deep. And then we start to get our biceps femoris uh, forming off of the lateral aspect. Again, overlying all this is gluteus maximus. So don't confuse uh, the large gluteus maximus fibers um, with that of the biceps femoris. As we move uh, down then to the, the junction of the semimembranosis, the semimembranosis is going to form on the far medial side of the semitendinosis. And that it, its um, structure here is unique in that it has a, a more lateral tendon and then it has this long membrane that stretches under the semitendinosis on top of the adductor magnus here and then the actual muscle that's over here medial. So here's the muscle of that membranosis as we come back from the sinew loop. This is all that long membrane. 
connecting the muscle, which is medial, membrane goes under the semitendinosus and adductor magnus to the more laterally oriented tendon. So this is one of the more confusing uh, parts, I think, of the hamstring um, complex. But once you are able to recognize that characteristic appearance of the semimembranosus tendon and membrane, uh, then, then it, you can quickly identify this location. So again, semitendinosus, semimembranosus formed here with the adductor magnus underlying. Uh, and then as we were just looking at that adductor magnus, if you move further medially and proximal, then we'll be back to that location uh, where we were looking at the issue of the portion of the adductor magnus. So if we look at the upper thigh uh, on this view here, which is uh, an extended field of view image, kind of capturing the entire thigh, we'll see in the upper third of the thigh, it's predominantly semitendinosus. Uh, we have the biceps that's starting to build, the semimembranosus, which has just started to come, um, which has just started to form here, and then the underlying adductor magnus. As we move down into the middle third of the thigh, uh, we see the muscles uh, start to become similar in size. So the tendinosus is starting to get a bit smaller. The biceps has continued to grow and it's larger, and the membranosus has continued to grow. And now they're all roughly similar in size. Uh, again, you've seen the adductor here, and now the vastus lateralis on this side um, here. <clears throat> in the middle third of the thigh, we'll begin to see the short head of the biceps femoris forming. And so here's the long head of the biceps. We're going to see the short head of the biceps starting to form uh, at this location here. And then it will start to get larger as the long head of the biceps starts to move superficial uh, and become smaller as it inserts uh, along this aponeurosis with the short head going down to begin to form the tendon of the biceps femoris distally. We'll then move over to the semitendinosus. And this is one of the key landmarks. And again, um, probably one of the more important ones next to the hyperbolic triangle to remember. So the semitendinosus has this interesting um, fascial septum that moves across the muscle and it's often referred to as a veil. And this is very characteristic. So as you're doing your dynamic scan and moving down in the short axis view, this will really catch your eye. You'll see this region right here as it moves along the, the semitendinosus. And it's a curvilinear concave posterior aponeurosis that's going to move from superficial medial down um, to the anterior lateral edge of the muscle. And this shouldn't be mistaken for scar tissue or any, any abnormality. It's normal. You'll see it normally within the muscle. Uh, and again, this helps you quickly identify this muscle as the semitendinosus without having to trace it back uh, either proximally or dis distally to its origin or insertion. All right, if we move lower down into the thigh, the, uh, the semitendinosus begins, becomes very small. It begins to move superficially where it's going to form its, its uh, distal tendon. The semimembranosus is getting larger uh, as we move distally. The long head of the biceps, again, is moving, is moving superficial as well and getting smaller. And the short head has grown and is larger, as we can see here. The uh, biceps uh, femoris muscle has an interesting architecture. And the long head actually inserts onto the superficial fascia of the short head. And, and for those of you who uh, do other areas of MSK imaging in the lower leg, this will look analogous to the medial gastroc inserting onto the fibers of the soleus just before they, they uh, become the Achilles tendon. And so this is a potential site of injury in an area that should always be closely uh, scrutinized, particularly in those athletes coming in with uh, distal lateral hamstring pain. You look for disinsertion of these fibers, and it will look analogous to that of a tennis leg or a medial gastroc injury uh, that you're probably familiar with. So all the way at the distal matching in this junction now, um, the, uh, the, bi the biceps um, short head is going to be the last muscle uh, that we're going to see over here as it then begins to form into the tendon. The semitendinosus um, becomes a very tendinous structure that lies superficial um, back overlying the semimembranosus. We'll start to see the gastroc uh, coming in, the lateral gastroc here at this location. And so that, that takes us all the way down to, uh, to the knee itself. And so uh, as I mentioned before, these are the important things you need to know and, and make sure you can really identify. And so if you're, if you're a little uh, newer to imaging this location, this is really the things that should be your priority list of, uh, of things to know and learn and know very, very well. The hyperpoic triangle, the membrane of the semimembranosus, the veil of the semitendinosus, and then the distal biceps tendon, 
and distal semitendinosus tendon. If you can quickly identify those, then you can orient yourself um, very quickly uh, to any areas of pathology that you may see as we move into that next level of scanning. <clears throat> All right, so if we uh, move into pathology here next, as mentioned, this is going to be best seen on the short axis and then confirmed uh, in the long axis. The timing of the scan here is going to be very important. And it's important to recognize that if you scan these injuries too early, you can end up with a false negative. And the optimal timing you know, will be debated, and many factors will play into when the optimal timing for injury is. You know, I'd say 36 to 48 hours is probably the optimal timing for imaging um, for most of these cases. Now, now that factors into a couple things. You know, one, it, it, you need a little bit of time for things to happen. So if you're if you're going to tear some through some of the the muscle and the fascia, you're going to have bleeding and hematoma formation, and that usually takes a couple days for that to fully develop so that you can identify it well. Uh, and you may even be able to see some of that better, um, you know, longer out than 36 to 48 hours. So you may see some some controversy in the literature there, suggesting even a few more days may be helpful. That being said, particularly in the sports medicine um, side, it, you're not going to get away with not looking at these for five days. And so, you know, people want you to look at them immediately, and particularly in our world today, where ultrasound is pretty accessible, and a lot of us are, are there at the time of injury or seeing folks in the training room the next day. Um, you know, you're going to want to be looking at these right away, and you're going to have pressure to look at these right away and figure out what the game plan is. And so, so 36 hours is kind of a nice compromise, I think, is allowed enough to happen where, where with careful scanning technique you can identify usually what you need to see, um, and also uh, moves things along for, for those involved, um, you know, on the coaching side uh, as well to start getting a plan. Um, that being said, don't be afraid to recommend follow-up scans if needed. If you scan someone at 36 hours um, and, and you're not quite convinced or, or you think the imaging doesn't quite fit with their clinical picture, then you certainly it's very reasonable to do a follow-up scan a couple days later to see if things have evolved. Um, and it's probably helpful to do follow-up scans anyways just to follow some of these injuries out for, for prognosticating value. Um, the other thing here that's important is Doppler. So don't forget about using the, the Doppler feature here to uh, to evaluate for hyperemia in the area. This can be helpful when you're when you're talking about uh, ongoing healing of an area, um, potentially increased risk of returning folks back. It can also be helpful when you're looking at reactivation of old injuries, and we'll show a few examples here um, of how that can be helpful. And sometimes that uh, those findings can be relatively subtle, and the Doppler can be very helpful. Just like tendon imaging, you need to be aware of muscle anisotropy, particularly with lower grades of muscle injuries. Um, that can simulate anisotropy, and you're at risk for both false positive and false negative um, because of that imaging artifact. So, so just be aware that that's there. Um, constantly uh, try to angle your transducer to eliminate that, and always convince yourself that indeed you're seeing um, the pathology that, that you think you are. Uh, another important point here as we move forward is that this rest of this talk is confusing because classification systems for muscle injuries are confusing. And there's no gold standard at this point, and there's no, definitely no consensus is exactly what we're talking about with muscle injuries. And so, so I'll try to, to give my slant on it uh, and try to make a little bit of sense of it, but just recognize that, that this is a confusing area and, um, and we probably still need to do some work here. Um, as mentioned previously, the history and physical are important in trying to get as much information there as you can. Um, particularly, if, are you talking about an entrance or extrinsic injury? You know, is this a muscle strain? Um, you know, during high-speed running, was it a contusion? Was it a hit from a you know a helmet into that area? Those are much much less common injuries here in the posterior thigh as opposed to the anterior thigh. Um, but you're going to see different patterns and different types of injuries um, depending on the mechanism. So. So trying to get that historical information and as part of that history, the timing again, as we already mentioned, is, is critical. Things to think about as you're looking at pathology, um, given the fact that we don't have a perfect classification scheme and some of these things are confusing, you simply describe things. So you want to look, you know, where is this injury has occurred? Is it isolated to a single muscle? Is it crossing some of these fascial aponeuroses? You know, where exactly is the, is the injury occurring? Is there a hematoma? Uh, that's helpful. Is it a large hematoma, small hematoma? Is it organized? Is it still liquid? Those are things that, that clinicians are going to want to know. 
uh, as well as the Doppler flow. You know, is there Doppler flow? What's it look like? Uh, those are all things you're going to want to include in your uh, in your diagnostic report. So we talked about muscle injury classifications. We'll go through this briefly. Um, but there's been several classifications, um, you know, over the years, and some just from a uh, just a physical exam or just a logic standpoint. Um, some using ultrasound, some using MRI. You can see a few different examples uh, here through the years. And as you can see, some of these are grade one, two, three. Some include a grade four. Uh, they're not necessarily consistent with each other. Because of that inconsistency, uh, there was a Munich consensus uh, classification system published a few years ago uh, back in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And, and this was a good attempt to try to come up with a better, more inclusive classification for muscle injuries. And, and so this tried to divide these into direct uh, versus indirect, so, so the strains versus contusion, uh, and then looking at partial tears, subtotal tears, you know, neuromuscular disorders, and then it kind of you know, branched all these off. And and this was was a was a fine attempt and probably has has some good um, you know good validity for research purposes but but for the clinician or for the you know the, the imager um, you know kind of left looking like Keanu here and not exactly sure what to do with all of these things and so I wasn't sure this was exactly helpful at least in my practice of of, of really conveying the information that I wanted to convey about what these injuries were uh, the Brits came up with, with something that was similar uh, but slightly different, and this did have some, some MRI, or at least some imaging correlate associated with it, and again, multiple grades with subclassification, but again, re relatively confusing, uh, and I'm not sure I'm going to necessarily, um, you know, say grade 3B, you know, injury and have my, uh, my clinician necessarily know what I'm talking about. Uh, this is another classification um, that, that I think is, is pretty helpful, and this is, is more or less uh, kind of what I will use uh, for classifying these muscle injuries. And, um, you know, grade zero is kind of just a little bit of swelling of, of the muscle. So this would be something you maybe see after a heavy workout, you see the weight onset muscle soreness, but no real muscle damage. Um, at grade one, you're starting to get the hyperechoic cloud or, um, or hyper uh, intensity on teach imaging uh, without disruption of the actual muscle uh, architecture. At grade two, you're starting to get some, some blurring and irregular edges with some disorganization in the muscle architecture, but it's not really reaching the supporting connective tissue and, and isn't uh, causing a lot of bleeding or hematoma. Once you start getting uh, hematoma formation um, and you're, you're you know, causing trouble across those uh, aponeurotic membranes, then you're starting to end up bleeding to cause hematoma, and that moves you into a grade three. And then if you have a partial or total rupture of the muscle, then that's grade four. And I think this is something that, that you can you can remember. It kind of makes sense, and at least gives you some degree uh, of severity and allows for some grading. So, so this is certainly not perfect, but it's what I will typically um, use for calling the air grading these uh, muscle type of injuries. The other big question is, is: Does any of this matter? And if you look at the literature, um, it's mixed. And so there's several studies that you'll see here. Um, stating that there's no statistical correlation with return to play and, and these imaging findings, whether they be on NMR or ultrasound. And, and I think a lot of this is just the heterogeneity of the injuries. So um, there's a lot of heterogeneity of injuries. I don't feel like any of our classification systems currently um, really capture that well. So I think we probably have some work to do from a research perspective there. Uh, and then also there's a lot of heterogeneity of athletes. And so um, the similar athlete from, say, one of my high school football players to one of my, um, you know, um, Division One football players who, who's going to the NFL combine is going to be a lot different. And uh, whenever you're trying to measure uh, return to play amongst different circumstances and different levels of, of genetics and ability, uh, it also gets a bit a bit challenging as, as with most, most of the things we do in sports medicine. So, so who knows? Uh, I think it may matter if we do a better job. Uh, in the meantime, you know, as I mentioned before, just try to describe things well. You can describe what these injuries are. You can describe what's happening. Uh, and then if we come up with a better scheme on the back end, um, you know, for research purposes, you can always go back and plug those uh, that data back into a new system if you described it well and, and stored your, your image as well. All right, we'll go through a few um, examples here, just some clinical cases of um, hamstring issues. And so we'll start at the proximal hamstring tendinopathy. 
this is a very, uh, very common presentation, something we'll see a lot, particularly in our middle-aged runners. Uh, we see this all the time. And this is uh, is basic tendinopathy. And tendinopathy looks the same anywhere really in the body. You're going to have thickening, swelling of the tendon, heterogeneity, hypoecogenicity. Uh, and that's what we see here in the short axis view. Here's our visual tuberosity. We can see this entire thing outlined by the arrow tiers. It's our big, swollen tendon. We don't really see the nice differentiation between the conjoined tendon and the semimembranosus components that we did before. Um, it's just a big, swollen, heterogeneous tendon. We can look in the long axis and we see the same correlative imaging. We see a little bit of irregularity here along the tuberosity, which is a very common finding uh, with any of these hamstring problems. And you'll see this a lot on radiographs as well. You'll see a little bit of you know, ratty um, edges along that ischial tuberosity, so it's so very common. <clears throat> you may also see Doppler flow um, or neovascularization within these areas. And so here we can see neovascularity of that proximal hamstring uh, complex. And in this sinew loop here, we'll actually see um, some more focal involvement of the semimembranosus as it moves up. So here we'll see this transition uh, from the relatively healthy uh, membranosus that we saw at, at the triangle where it gets thickened and heterogeneous. So if the sinew loop runs one more time, we'll see right here this starts to become um, hypoechoic, starts to get thick as it moves up and then, um, and then has this uh, tendinopathic appearance on the ischial tuberosity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is an example of a higher grade um, proximal hamstring tendinosis, um, and, and this is actually a, a partial thickness tear within the hamstring tendon. Um, this area gets a little bit confusing, and I know um, I, I kind of work in, in two areas here. I'm kind of part radiology and part orthopedics, and, and so I get to hear people argue back and forth about how you describe these things and how you call these, and I know and the orthopedists often don't like the words tears um, in context of these things that are really a tendinosis just because it gives the patient this idea that something is torn and needs to be fixed and often these are non-surgical problems. Um, and a lot of times it may be difficult to really distinguish between what's a, a partial tear and you know what is um, just high-grade tendinosis. And so I think in cases like this, um, it, it's not wrong to call this high-grade tendinosis. Here we can see we actually this was this was a very thin patient. We have very good imaging. We can see no doubt this is a partial thickness tear. We see a region devoid of tendon fibers with uh, free fluid, and this was compressible fluid. So this is something I did call partial uh, intrasubstance tear. Um, but oftentimes it may be difficult to really identify. You know, is, is this free fluid? Is it just bad tissue in there? And uh, and I think if if the tendon is certainly intact. Um, and looks crummy, uh, calling it high-grade tendinosis is, is probably a safer bet. <clears throat> so here's a, another example of that adductor magnus is your condylar portion tendinosis, and it looks similar to what I showed you from the, uh, the hamstring proper of tendinosis. We see irregularity along the issue of tuberosity. We see calcification uh, within the tendon here, uh, and, then, and then just some hypoechoic uh, heterogeneity of the tendon. And so uh, I see calcifications are relatively common here. Um, you know, there's not much in the literature regarding uh, this tendon. Uh, in my experience over the last year of scanning quite a few of these, I think that having irregularity along this portion is very, very common. And I'm not convinced that it holds a lot of um, a diagnostic utility. You know, certainly that's part of the um, you know, tendinosis. Uh, findings, but I also see a lot of asymptomatic folks, and so I want to get overly concerned um, with some quarter irregularity regularity here. I think it's a pretty common finding. It's, it's you know probably adaptive in a lot of these athletes, um, but but it should be to um, you know at least a little bit closer evaluation of the tendon if you do see that, and trying to correlate this with with symptoms. This is a fair bit away from the the hamstring proper. And so you can differentiate differentially palpate this location versus you know the hamstring proper, um, you know more uh, superior and lateral on the ischial tuberosity. And so simply by by pressing firmly with the transducer and trying to correlate the location of pain, that can be very helpful uh, in distinguishing some of these symptomatic from asymptomatic findings. So here's an example of a of a membrane uh, problem within the semimembranosus. And so we'll see. Here's the, the semimembranosus tendon. Here's that membrane stretching under the tendinosus here with the adductor below. 
and we can see this area here of some uh, some hypoecogenicity, actually a little bit of fluid. We see this hyperechoic structure through here, uh, which may be a, a little calcification or a little bit of a partial tear um, of that membrane off of the tendon. And so this is another area um, that, that that you may see, um, you know, some isolated pathology in that that's actually doesn't look too bad as we move all the way up towards the ischial tuberosity. <clears throat> so if we look at muscle injuries now, and this is an example of, of a grade one uh, muscle injury, and um, and you can see this hyperechoic uh, cloud-like appearance, but it's just sitting in in otherwise relatively normal fiber. And so you know, when we look at the short axis view here, you know this very well could be muscle anisotropy. That's why I said you have to be careful with that. But we see this slightly uh, hyperechoic region within the superficial aspect of the muscle here. And as we look at the long axis view here, again we can see this cloud-like. Um, hyperechogenicity involving the superior superficial aspect uh, of the semitendinosus. If you look at this in the semi loop, I think it becomes a little bit more clear than the still images um, of what this looks like. So this indeed is a grade one muscle injury, but we really see no disruption of the fibers, and that's what makes it a grade one. And so this was a track athlete that came in, um, you know, had a pretty limiting hamstring injury at the time, and we scanned her, um, you know, a couple of days after her uh, after her injury, uh, and saw this, and this was actually very reassuring uh, for us. So, so she certainly had an injury. Um, you know, the coaches were, were thinking the worst, thinking she was going to be out for a few weeks, uh, and actually she was able to get back on the track relatively quickly. Uh, and so this was very helpful in, in prognosticating. So if we move up the chain uh, of injury, we'll see a, a small grade two injury here. And these can sometimes be a little bit um, tricky to pick up. And so the areas often that you'll want to really look at are going to be uh, the regions around the muscles, so kind of the junctions between the two. And we'll see here, you know, this looks pretty good, this looks pretty good, but we see this small little hypochloric rim, this little region of uh, fiber disruption along the semimembranosus. This is where the Doppler really comes in helpful because if we put the Doppler around, we can see this really lights up like crazy all through this area. So you know this could be something you may blow over uh, if you're not scanning carefully. Uh, but now we throw the Doppler on, and then, and then no doubt it's going to catch your eye, and then you can correlate that um, with, with the structural pathology. This will be a higher grade injury, and these are a little bit more apparent. So this is going to be um, what we probably grade out as a grade three tear along the atherosclerosis because we're beginning to see some hematoma uh, at this at this point. This is going to be the most common injury pattern that I see, and I know that goes against uh, what's commonly in the literature at this point, um, which you know states that the biceps femoris injuries are going to be the most common. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, in my experience, um, you know, scanning the you know, Division One football players, track and field athletes. Um, this is this is far and away the most common injury pattern that I'll see, and it happens within the semi tendinosis um, along the aponeurosis of the biceps femoris, kind of at that muscle tendon junction, just below the conjoint tendon. And so often what we'll see is this disinsertion of these muscle fibers along that aponeurosis. You see some hypoechoic hematoma form. This is a, a video loop just showing um, the compressibility of that tissue. So you can see the swelling within the tissue and then the actual compressibility of free fluid or hematoma in liquid form uh, at this location. This is a more extensive injury uh, of, the, of the same type. This was actually the same athlete who had a recurrence and, and worsening of that other injury that we saw later in the season. And so now at this point, not only is the semitendinosis involved, which is here, that tear is now extended across the aponeurosis over into the biceps femoris laterally here, and so we can see right down the, the central aponeurosis between the two, uh, you know, which 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 is effectively that you know, the conjoint tendon as it comes down. Um, this area we see a lot of structural disruption. We see a lot of hyperemia. We see some uh, some free fluid as well as organized hematoma all within this area. Uh, and this is now a pretty significant injury. This, you know, for a track and field athlete, it's going to take several weeks to get back from. And then the grade four injuries uh, are pretty straightforward. Um, whenever we're looking at at, at these, um, you know, uh, partial or, or complete avulsions, you know, definitely complete avulsions of release muscle um, uh, <coughs> portions of the muscle. 
So this is going to be, uh, you know, after we saw, here's the proximal hamstring tendon at the issue of tuberosity, and we can see just below that, in the myosinitis junction, there's just a large um, area of retract muscle fiber uh, filled in with this anechoic uh, liquid hematoma uh, at this portion here. We can see as the muscle fibers pull back, um, they pull off and lose tension. They begin to, to ball up a little bit. So you'll have this appearance here, um, as well as the, the fluid tracing down through this. This athlete comes in with a big, you know, amount of bruising all the way down the back of their leg. They had a sudden pop, uh, you know, in the back, and it, it's a pretty straightforward uh, history and physical exam. Um, but the imaging, you know, certainly is helpful here to, to grade this injury out. <clears throat> this is an example of, of acute injury. Um, this was actually an interesting um, uh, patient I had, one of our track and field athletes who had kind of a chronic nagging injury. Um, that he was still able to compete in, um, but it was just slowing him down a little bit. He was a, a, a hurdler and sprinter. And we can see here, uh, he has a relatively large area. This is an extended field of view image here. He has a relatively large region of uh, muscle disorganization um, that's, that's tried to heal. And so we can see this is starting to organize. Um, but there's still a lot of edema around here, a lot of disorganization, some organized hematoma. Um, and this is the long axis view. This is the short axis view as well. And again, you'll often see these little halos of um, anechogenicity or hypoepigenicity around these fibers as they, they ball up a little bit, they disinsert, and there'll be a little fluid around that between the, the aponeurosis surrounding it. So this is a common thing that'll catch your eye on that short axis view. So this athlete actually um, you know, did pretty well um, and was healing up and then later in the season had a subsequent re-injury. And so this is, this are his, uh, these are his images, uh, the same athlete you know, several months later after re-injuring this. And we can see that, that things look a lot better uh, as we come down through the bulk of this muscle. But we'll see here's the small area. This is the semi-tendinosis, semi-membranosis. Here's a small area where he retore this uh, along this region. And so we'll see this little area here. And this is the same um, loop that's just blown up. So you can see it a little bit better. And so right along this region um, of scar tissue, we'll see hyperechoic tissue, that scar. And then now we'll see this new area of liquid hematoma uh, where he had an acute new injury on top of this old chronic injury. Uh, the last thing we'll cover here is going to be uh, you know, very chronic um, reactivation of a scar. So this was an athlete who had an old hamstring injury, healed, got back, was doing fine. Then the following season, felt like he tweaked something in his hamstring. Um, and, and he was concerned, although he was still able to train, it wasn't horrible. We scanned him, and at first pass, things looked pretty good. And if you watch the semi loop, we're coming through. You know, I always have these athletes you know, kind of point right to where they think they hurt. And, you know, usually they're right. They're pretty astute about these things. And he pointed right here, and at first pass, I'm like, that looks pretty good. Um, but we saw this little area as we come down that just catches your eye. So it's going to be a small area of hyperepigenicity right through there. And if we blow it up in the still, it's going to look like this. And so this is what a scar looks like. It um, can be pretty subtle. Uh, but then if we put the Doppler on, we see all this um, flow around that scar. So this would be consistent with the reactivation of that old injury. But he hasn't, uh, he doesn't have any further fiber disruption. There's no hematoma. So this is, falls into a lower grade injury. Um, so this is something that you can see in the Doppler flow. You know, this isn't perfect, but I think it, it's helpful clinically, at least, at least anecdotally, is that Doppler flow often follows the, the stages of healing. And so this would be an example of a reactivation injury with Doppler. Once that Doppler flow ceases and you don't see that anymore, uh, then, then we kind of think of the injury as cold. And so it's the same thing for an, a new injury as well, not just for reactivation. You can follow the Doppler along, and, and once that Doppler flow goes away, you feel better about returning the athlete. It doesn't mean 100% the athlete's ready to go. Um, you still have to take them through all your functional testing and such. But if you, you know, the athletes often feel better after these injuries pretty quickly, and there's a very high injury recurrence. And so one of the things that may be helpful to follow is actually looking at this Doppler flow. Because you may see an athlete who feels pretty good, um, and they, they no longer have hematoma, things have organized, things look like they're healing well, but they still have a fair degree of Doppler flow along the area of injury. 
um, you have to be a little cautious with them, and they're probably at higher risk for re-injury of that area. So that's one thing I think that can be helpful um, in doing serial exams, and particularly in trying to be one component of the return to play policy, is being very cautious with returning these athletes um, who may have had, uh, who may have had um, ongoing Doppler flow along these areas. All right, so take home points. Um, you have to know your anatomy back here, and, and the hamstring anatomy is a little confusing. Uh, you got tendon moving from one side to the other, things sitting superficial and deep, and back and forth along the tuberosity. Uh, and, and so you really just need to, to get very comfortable with the anatomy um, back in this area and comfortable with the landmarks that we mentioned. The landmarks um, will help you orient quickly. Otherwise, it, it can be a very taxing exam if you have to you know, trace every muscle back to the origin or insertion to figure out what you're looking at and know where you're at. It, it can be very challenging and time consuming. So really, know the landmarks so you can quickly orient to where you're at. Um, know the timing of your, of your injury. Uh, if you have some say in when you're scanning these, um, you know, try to push it off a couple days if possible. Um, you know, if you if you can't do that because uh, the coach is staring at you in the training room, um, ask to bring the athlete back in, or you know, go back to the training room a couple days later at least to follow up on it. Uh, particularly if you're not convinced you saw everything that that you needed to see. Uh, grading of injury is, is confusing. Um, it may not be all that helpful uh, clinically, at least in our current forms, but have some system in which you're going to use that you're comfortable with uh, in a way that you're comfortable reporting these injuries. And make sure the people who are looking at your reports know what you're talking about. So, um, so if you're not scanning your own patients, if you're scanning for your orthopedist or for your sports medicine colleagues, um, you know, sit down with them, kind of tell them what you can see, how you're going to describe things, ask them what they want to know, uh, and then try to try to work together to come up with a plan that works for you, um, kind of within the current systems that we talked about. Yeah, and that kind of goes along with this last point. You know, say where the where the injury is at. Um, you know, kind of what the extent is. Uh, is there a hematoma? Is it not? Is it liquid? Is, is it organized? Is there Doppler flow? Uh, those are all things that, that really are, are critical here that ultrasound does a very good job in. Um, it's very helpful uh, for these injuries. All right, folks, I managed to, to speak for uh, for 56 minutes per my watch here, so I'm um, so sorry about that, but we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, and I am going to try to uh, to expand my little question box here so I can see some and then I'll start trying to answer uh, some of these off. So the uh, so one question here how often do you see cortical irregularity of the ischial tuberosity in patients without injury uh, of ham, hamstring or uh, adductor pathology and ultrasound? And I would say um, particularly in older athletes, and so master's level of athletes, um, which that gets younger and younger every year as I get older, but you know, when you're in the 40s, 50s, 60s, it starts to become relatively common. And, um, and hamstring pathology there also is, is relatively common. It may not always be symptomatic. Uh, and so, so, for example, last week I saw a 40-something um, you know, uh, triathlete who had you know a little, little bit of you know hamstring problems and still was training for Ironmans or such and such and, and had a a very high grade partial tear at the hamstring which makes me very nervous. Um, so so pathology here is pretty common and, and cortical irregularities are actually very common. If you look at your radiographs, you'll see this all the time as well. So again, I think it, it's not like the in the rotator cuff where where there's a very high positive predictive value per se, um, at least with, with symptomatic problems back here. But but you should note it and, and you should look closely if you see that. Um, somebody, let's see here. Yeah, and another similar question about uh, cortical irregularities there I think I mentioned. So someone asked, do you always image with the knee in full extension? Is there utility in a dynamic exam? So that's a good question. So I usually will <clears throat> kind of have the patient prone with the knee extended to, to do um, um, you know, the, the, the survey exam anyways. When you're looking at particular areas, um, and you're trying to get a little bit more information about the extent of injury, doing a dynamic exam here can be helpful. And doing contraction tests can actually be pretty helpful, putting the muscle in tension uh, and seeing uh, sometimes that may reveal a little more significant injury than you may have thought. 
or in some challenging cases, particularly with hamstring avulsion injuries, sometimes it's, it's actually really challenging to, to make a good call on the hamstring avulsion, um, particularly in larger patients. And so using that dynamic scan can be helpful um, looking for, for tissue motion there, so just kind of doing some resistance uh, about the hamstring. Um, <clears throat> sorry for the delay here as I read through some of these questions. Uh, so this is a good question too. Any posterior bursts of pathology um, to note of? And so, so that's a good question. And so I know we always talk about the issue of radial bursa, um, and, and, and I used to get a lot of referrals for for bursitis back here. Uh, I think only once have I ever actually seen where I considered bursitis at this location, where I saw um, you know free fluid um, that was in, in some bursal plane. You know, there is a bursal tissue plane back here. Um, Almost invariably, when somebody comes in with that clinical diagnosis, I see tendinopathy, uh, and I think that fits with what we're starting to learn about other other locations. Um, you know, the, the greater trochanter, for example. Um, you know, much more common to see tendinopathy than, than bursopathy there. And so, so you know, it's probably a thing. Um, but but I tend to see um, you know I, I just tend to see tendinopathy, and 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 what I thought was previously bursitis maybe, which which was more medial to the hamstring, I now think is adductor. Um, and, and so it can, I, I just see pathology in the tendon there. Um, let me look for one other one, then we'll call it good. Um, so so here's a here's a good one to end it on, I think. Um, it's probably me saying more of the same, but you know, the biggest challenge when you first started seeing the posterior thigh. Uh, and I think, you know, with any of these, it's a complex area, and, uh, and it wasn't having a really good appreciation of the anatomy and how the anatomy moves as you go, go um, uh, up and down the thigh. And so it was very easy to get confused uh, by the different muscles and, and what you were looking at. And I think, I think trying to come, come systematically, um, which was very important for me, and so I pin each muscle from the top to the bottom, and I don't try to get too confused. I know I showed you some of those extended field of view images um, where we're looking at all these muscles all across the thigh. And if you try to process in that manner, if you're going to get yourself very confused. And so I do a quick survey, um, just kind of taking in the big picture to know where I'm going to have to look closely at to see if there's big bad stuff, then I go literally step by step, muscle by muscle from proximal to distal and, and slowly go down the whole way. And I come back up and I do it again. Uh, and I also include some of the more medial we talk about them, but you know, looking at the gracilis and all this, I mean, I, I go the whole way and just very stepwise and very slow. Um, and eventually that becomes very fast. You know, you can do this very quickly once you get comfortable with that, but try not to, um, you know, try not to get too too confused by the by the big picture. Uh, you know, and just kind of go each each one by one, and then kind of put it all together on the back end. All right, everyone's probably got stuff to get to today. Um, I'd like to thank everybody again for joining us. We had a really good turnout um, tonight. I'm very happy about this new collaboration. Uh, I hope we have a whole bunch more of these uh, AMSSM AIUM webinars. Um, Again, appreciate everyone joining, and thanks again to Kathy and AIUM for hosting this. Good night, everybody. And it was certainly our pleasure. Thanks so much, Dr. Hall, and on behalf of the AIUM and the AMSSM, our thanks to all of you who participated in tonight's webinar. Everyone, please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation, and will join us again for many future webinars. Good night, everyone.